and to the celebration of women in the judiciary. My name is Larissa Randleman and I'm the President of Women Lawyers New South Wales. Tonight we celebrate the women appointed to the judiciary in 2019 in New South Wales and this year a special recognition for an appointment to the Supreme Court of the ACT and we acknowledge the appointment of Her Excellency the Honourable Margaret Beasley AOQC as Governor of New South Wales. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Yaora Nation, and recognise their continued connection to land, water and culture. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Can I spend a few minutes acknowledging our special guests? The Honourable Justice Virginia Bell, AC, High Court of Australia. The Honourable Justice Stephen Gagler, AC, High Court of Australia. The Honourable Chief Justice Tom Bathurst, Supreme Court of New South Wales. The Honourable Justice Andrew Bell, President, um, Court of Appeal, Supreme Court of New South Wales. The Honourable Justice Julie Ward, Chief Justice in Equity, Supreme Court of New South Wales. Judge Gerard Phillips, Workers' Compensation Commission. The Honourable Justice Melissa Perry, Federal Court of Australia. The Honourable Justice Nicola Payne, Land and Environment Court of New South Wales. The Honourable Justice Julian Lonergan, Supreme Court of New South Wales. Judge Paul Lakatos, President, Mental Health Review Tribunal. The Honourable, um, sorry, Nicola Constant, Chief Commissioner, Industrial Relations Commission, New South Wales. Judge Liz Boyle, Federal Circuit Court. The Honourable Justice Wendy Abraham, Federal Court of Australia. The Honourable Justice Louise Henderson, Family Court of Australia. Judge Monica Neville, Federal Circuit Court. The Honourable Justice Krista Lucas Carlson, Supreme Court of ACT. The Honourable Justice Lucy McCallum, Court of Appeal, Supreme Court of New South Wales. The Honourable Justice Kelly Rees, Supreme Court of New South Wales. The Honourable Justice Leah Armstrong, Supreme Court of New South Wales and President of NCAT. The Honourable Justice Trish Henry, Supreme Court of New South Wales. The Honourable Justice Sandra Duggan, Land and Environment Court. Judge Wendy Strathy, District Court of New South Wales and Dust Diseases Tribunal. Judge Kara Sheed, District Court of New South Wales. Judge Nanette Williams, District Court of New South Wales. Judge Sharon Harris, District Court of New South Wales. Judge Suzanne Cole, District Court of New South Wales and Deputy President of NCAT. Judge Sophia Becker, District Court of New South Wales. Magistrate Teresa O'Sullivan, New South Wales State Coroner. Magistrate Lee Leanne Robinson, Local Court of New South Wales. Magistrate Deborah Ma, Local Court of New South Wales. Magistrate Georgina Darcy, Local Court of New South Wales. Magistrate Fiona McCarran, Local Court of New South Wales. Magistrate Holly Kemp, Local Court of New South Wales. Magistrate Lisa Viney, Local Court of New South Wales. Magistrate it's all of you. <laughs> uh, a few more. Uh, Magistrate Sally McLaughlin, Local Court of New South Wales. Magistrate Janine Lacey, Local Court of New South Wales. Magistrate Alison Hawkins, Lo Local Court of New South Wales. Magistrate Gillian Keeley, Local Court of Hi. New South Wales. Sorry, Kylie. <laughs> Lloyd Babb, Director of DPP. Pauline Wright, President of Law Council of New South Wales. Greg Tolhurst, Executive Director of New South Wales Bar Association. Michael Tidball, CEO of Law Society of New South Wales. Adrienne Morton, President of Australian Women Lawyers. Laurie Middlehurst, President of Australian Corporate Council of New South Wales. John McKenzie, Legal Services Commissioner of New South Wales. Michael McHugh, SC, Senior VP of New South Wales Bar Association. The Honourable Ruth McColl, AO. Kingsley Liu, President, Asian Australian Lawyers Society. Richard Harvey, President of the Law Society of New South Wales. David Edney, President of New South Wales Young Lawyers. And Emeritus Professor Rosalind Croucher, AM, President of the Australian Human Rights Commission. <laughs> Welcome to words. I know everyone's standing and wants to get to drinking and socialising, but something about um, what we plan to do in 2020. In 1997, the Honourable Justice Mary Gordon, uh, the first female to be appointed to the High Court of Australia, gave a speech to the Australian Women Lawyers, 
and she referred to a note she sent to a fellow High Court judge saying, the trouble with women of my generation is that we thought if we knocked the doors down, success would be inevitable. The trouble with men of your generation is that so many still think that if they hold the door open, we will be forever grateful. <laughs> well, in New South Wales, at least since 1997, more women graduated as lawyers than men. But in 2020, we know that there's substantial evidence to demonstrate that gender equality will not occur simply by the affliction of time. Success for women in the legal profession, if judged as a representation of women in leadership positions, has not been inevitable because it's not about holding the door open into a culture and structure created overwhelmingly by men for men. It is about a culture and structures adapting to women adapting to people with caring responsibilities, becoming a profession which is more respectful of difference, more transparent and inclusive. Women do bring a distinct contribution to law because of their particular experiences and backgrounds. The difference makes the profession stronger. It makes the profession more able to be an effective servant of justice on which our economy and society depend. In 2019, we focused on five key areas. First that firms should set target for admission to partnership and promotion into leadership roles based on a 40-40 model. Secondly, that firms should adopt targets for men taking up parental leave and flexible work arrangements and develop strategies to actively encourage all employees and partners to share caring responsibilities. Thirdly, that all briefing entities and barristers need to adopt the Law Council's equitable briefing policy. Fourthly, that firms and the bar should consider the incidence of sexual harassment and discrimination as an issue that affects the whole of the profession and adopt the proactive, proactive measures that remove the pressure on victims to report. And lastly, that all law firms should be undertaking an annual gender pay analysis. I'm pleased to say that last year we did see a number um, of law firms um, taking positive steps, particularly adopting the targets and some starting to talk about transparency around remuneration. We do commend the work of John McKenzie, the Legal Services Commissioner, in introducing a safer and more accessible complaint making procedures as to sexual harassment and bullying, but we know that the cultural change will not occur until those in leadership position, positions are held to account through remuneration or other means as maintaining a respectful workplace culture and there should be positive bystander obligations on senior people, such as silks, clerks, partners, and those in senior roles in law firms to call out inappropriate conduct. In 2020, we will continue to highlight the continued inequalities through advocacy, involvement in reform, in law reform through educational and networking events, and we will continue to work on becoming more inclusive of women in regional areas and being diverse in our representation. We do have a long way to go in reaching inequality. The women at the New South Wales Bar are unable to break the 25% mark, and uh, for silks it's just under 12%. And it's not only because women are choosing not to come to the bar, it's because women also are leaving the bar. For women in private law firms, the position is not much rosier. The percentage of women in equity partnership is very difficult to measure because it's secret. But on our best estimates, based on data collected over the last six years, the percentage is less than 20%. And on the available data, um, the position of women on boards of law firms is lower than that for ASX 200 companies. In a recent study by Amelia Lachlan that analysed two years of tra transcript for high court um, sittings, um, found that uh, female judges were more likely to be interrupted compared to male judges, um, but could not measure the interruption by female counsel um, because the number was so low that it would be statistically insignificant. <laughs> um, what I have observed in the last couple of years is that the legal profession is most likely to change where there is external pressure, whether that be from clients who want to see more women briefed or from overseas regulatory requirements, which impact on many of the firms operating in Australia, such as requirements for targets, transparency, and accountability measures. As we are a highly hierarchical profession, any comments from those in senior roles within the profession, particularly from the judiciary and from our professional associations, are also likely to be influential. Women 
lawyers values your involvement in this journey in making the profession stronger and fairer and more accessible for all of us and thank you for your participation and involvement and if you're not a member we ask you to consider consider joining and if you are a member consider be, becoming more active now as they say in, um, in the media I have a scoop um, <laughs> The Honourable Justice of the High Court, Virginia Bell, who has been an active participant and supporter of women lawyers throughout her illustrious career, has agreed to be the patron of women lawyers. Yeah. Uh, her honour has been uh, a judge of the Supreme Court since 1999. She commenced her career at Redfern Legal Centre. On this Mardi Gras, I think we should all celebrate with her honour, the fact that she was one of the original 1978 Mardi Gras participants. <laughs> and that she, together with others, defended the 53 people arrested during the first Mardi Gras protests and in the following years defended people who fought against police harassment of gay people, women and Aboriginal people under the Summary Offences Act. She was particularly active in advocating for those facing incarceration and she was involved in the Women Behind Bars and Prisoners Action Group. Without further ado, I give you the living legend, our very own RBG. <laughs> If anyone's name hasn't been mentioned in the course of the introduction, because I'd very much like to have my photograph taken with them for history. <laughs> Will you forgive me if I just say collectively, judicial colleagues old and new, <laughs> fellow women lawyers, and discerning men attendees. <laughs> What can we say except we're in our comfort zone? <laughs> we're, we're here sequestered together in a club. We've got something very like champagne and plentiful, <laughs> plentiful canapes. And there's not much risk that any of us is going to have to engage with a non-lawyer. <laughs> Every two years, the Women Lawyers Association of New South Wales holds this event to mark the appointment of women judicial officers over the preceding two years. And pretty well every two years, so it's starting to seem, I speak at the event. Uh, there's a certain sameness, which I hope you'll all find in its own way comforting. Uh, the first time I spoke at this event, about 20 years ago, we women judges enjoyed a certain cachet, uh, if not rarity value, which I rather regret has passed. <laughs> in 1999, when Margaret Beasley, now Her Excellency, Carolyn Simpson and I together constituted the Court of Criminal Appeal of New South Wales. It made headlines throughout the common law world. 21 years later, an all-woman uh, appellate bench is entirely lacking in any elan. Um, as the very long list of appointments read out tonight um, demonstrates, women have attained critical mass. Now, none of this is to suggest that women judges and magistrates don't continue to be the victims of the most pervasive and deep-rooted oppression. I'm conscious that newer and younger appointees might be completely awake to it. Um, perhaps that's because it's at its most virulent in the High Court. Uh, <laughs> Larissa mentioned the study of which some of you may have seen reports in the newspapers. Um, it's about to be published in the Melbourne University Law Review. It's snappily titled, The Interruption Behaviour During Oral Argument in the High Court. <laughs> it's a penetrating insight into what I've put up with over the past 11 years. <laughs> The author studied the transcripts of hearings before the full court held between 2015 and 2017.
The results of that survey show that the female justices are interrupted by counsel more frequently than the male justices. That result is said to accord with behavioural research showing, quotes, men interrupt women at a far higher rate than vice versa. It would be tempting to question the empirical basis for a conclusion <laughs> quite that broad were it not for our shared lived experience of <laughs> gender domination. The author of the High Court um, study advocates training for counsel to sensitise them to their implicit biases and she proposes that the Chief Justice take a more active role in regulating oral argument. Now, at that point in the analysis, the author confronted the difficulty that the Chief Justice of Australia is a woman. Um, she suggested that a male Chief Justice might be less likely to be seen as biased towards other women judges, and for that reason that a male Chief Justice might be more effective in performing the suggested <coughs> regulatory role. Now, initially I have to tell you, I thought it was counterintuitive. <laughs> <laughs> that a study concerning the perceived unequal treatment of women judges should propose the appointment of a male Chief Justice <laughs> as a remedial measure. <laughs> But that may be because I haven't really appreciated the full dimensions of the problem. The frequency of interruptions is said to disadvantage the women justices in their ability to pursue a line of thought in oral argument. The author neutrally, some might say tactfully, suggests that this may impede informed decision making. <laughs> Given the common law's oral tradition, the assumed lack of full participation in the deliberative process is suggested to cast doubt on the substantive equality enjoyed by the women justices, and that in turn calls into question the court's integrity as a representative institution in a modern liberal society. Now, although, although of course, I had an inkling of the problem, <laughs> truthfully, I hadn't taken on board the implications for the maintenance of liberal democracy. <laughs> Even so, I find myself not drawn to the appointment of a male Chief Justice. <laughs> or to sensitivity training camps. I can't quite put my finger on the solution, but at a visceral level, I'm attracted to the judicial equivalent of the robust, if somewhat oblique advice, painted on a wall in Wigram Road Glebe in the early 1970s, which simply read, vote noisy women in the Senate. <laughs> I've no idea who wrote it or what it means. All I can say is the moment I read it, I knew I was in sympathy with it. <laughs> of course, women judges are not only of interest to the Academy, because we're so put upon by men, there's the seemingly endless academic interest in whether we can decide cases differently because we're women. On only one occasion in my time on the court have we divided along gender lines. It occurred in a case in which the full court was constituted by only six justices because one of our number was about to retire. The case uh, was an appeal from a conviction about a, a concerned a provision which criminalised the sending of seriously offensive mail through the postal service. The appellant contended that the offence-creating provision 
uh, impermissibly burdened the implied freedom of communication on political and governmental matters. Chief Justice French and Justices Hayne and Hayden upheld that challenge. Justices Crennan, Kiefel, and I rejected it. Professor Zifkak wrote a piece about the case which was published as an op-ed piece in The Australian. He described the decision as an intriguing illustration of the phenomenon identified in psychological studies that male and female conceptions of justice differ. Men tending to define justice in formal and contractual terms and women tending to define it in contextual and relational terms in which the private sphere assumes importance. As I've pointed out elsewhere, I thought the analysis was deficient only in the failure to take into account consideration of the procedural history. The matter came to the High Court on appeal. The consequence of the even division in our court was to affirm the decision of the Court of Criminal Appeal. The Court of Criminal Appeal on that occasion was constituted by Chief Justice Bathurst, President Allsop, and Justice McClellan, Chief Judge of Common Law. If Professor Zifkak's thesis is right, to my mind, the more remarkable aspect of this litigation is that at the time, the three most senior male judges in New South Wales, by some unexplained serendipity, were all gifted with a female sense of justice. <laughs> These are... <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> These, uh, these reflections on large topics, I understand, uh, have diverted me a little from my object, which is, of course, to congratulate all the recently appointed women judges and magistrates and to express my hope that they will not face the hurdles that Chief Justice Kiefel and Justice Gordon and I daily encounter. <laughs> uh, I'm conscious that, given the numbers of women judicial officers at all levels of the hierarchy and our substantial representation within the profession, that there are those who query the continued existence of an association like the Women Lawyers Association. Um, I'm not in that camp. It seems to me we need to continue to recognise, as Larissa was emphasising, that the advocacy done by feminist groups, including women lawyers, has been responsible for creating a climate in which it's become no longer acceptable to exclude women from judicial office. Shortly before her retirement as President of the Supreme Court of England and Wales, Baroness Hale, at one of those events which nowadays is described as being in conversation with an interlocutor, um, said this, I have never hesitated to call myself a feminist. It should never be a term of abuse or embarrassment. We should be equal to men and have equal rights. Everybody in this room should be a feminist. I find it quite astonishing that it took until 2004 to put a woman in the House of Lords. I say with respect, Brenda Hale was spot on. Um, while we can't afford to take our eyes off the ball, in terms of the makeup of appointments to the bench, the important work of this association for the present is directed, as Larissa explained, to redressing the systemic factors which disadvantage women practitioners. Um, it's not without significance that the pressure on the firms now to brief female counsel, and on occasions there is, is coming from the big clients and not from the firms. That phenomenon reflects the effectiveness of advocacy in bringing about cultural change. This association's law firm comparison project has been a driver in that respect. Women lawyers all need to be active in the association and in the work of its committees. I say that in my new role <laughs> as its <laughs> It's a funny thing. 
you never quite see yourself as becoming a patron. <laughs> Just as you never quite see yourself as on the cusp of constitutional senility. <laughs> These things just happen. <laughs> and it's only now and then that the incongruity of it hits you. And then, even more oddly, you find that it doesn't seem incongruous to anyone else. <laughs> I should say that there is one sad dimension to becoming the patron of women lawyers of New South Wales. And that is the death last year of our long-standing patron, Jane Matthews. Jane was a decade older than me, and that was a significant decade. Jane, like Mary Gordon and Elizabeth Everett, was a pioneer woman lawyer. And throughout her career, she was committed to the advancement of women in the profession. She founded the Australian Association of Women Judges. Its president, Judge Tupman, is here tonight, and she is keen for all newly appointed women judicial officers to join that organisation, and I encourage you to do so. Um, Jane, of course, also was, as I say, the long-standing patron of this association. In retirement, when Jane wasn't in Bayreuth or some other <laughs> Uh, European Cultural Centre humming along to yet another Wagnerian room cycle. <laughs> she was a fixture at all women lawyers' events. She was a role model to me and to all women uh, of my generation at the bar, immensely personally supportive. Later this year, in another scoop that it's left to me to announce, uh, this association is going to host some as yet quite not fully conceptualised but gala event which will honour Jane and which will seek to raise substantial funds so that we can have a scholarship in her name to assist a young woman to enter the profession. Because we are by nature drawn to the private sphere, the association marks the appointment of women judicial officers, not only by this function, but at this function, presenting them with flowers with which to decorate that sphere. <laughs> in the past, this was done individually, but we have so many new appointees <laughs> that we've slimmed the whole procedure down. So can I just invite the new appointees to come up because we've got to have the mandatory group photograph and then I'll ask you to each take your own bunch of flowers which, and I hope that's not going to kind of descend into an unjudicial melee. But thank you all and can I just get all the new appointees to come up and join me in the photo, okay?